Good morning. Good to see you all here today. It's good to be back today. We've had a number of people been down with illness, yours truly included, and we always miss it when we're gone. However, for the first time last week, I was able to watch the whole service live on, uh, on the TV screen from YouTube, and that was interesting, but I would have rather been here. So glad you're here today, and we have ver various guests with us and all. We welcome you to our services today. And if you are watching us live, especially if you're homesick, we uh, are sorry we miss you, but we're glad you can join us live or from the um, video that will go on during the week. I'm going to open with a scripture. This is a scripture of praise and worship reminding us that God the Creator is in charge of all things and that the idols of the world are nothing, that God is the only true God. I'm going to ask if you're able to stand as you read the scripture. Remain standing for our song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him, strength and joy in his dwelling place. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Let's do that as we sing. shines full at him. 
Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. We'd like to welcome you and thank you for that wonderful singing this morning. What a way to start off a Sunday morning. Thank you uh, for being here. Haitian Christian Mission is there as our prayer focus and mission of the month. Um, It's hard not to be aware of the hardships that are in Haiti right now. And so a particularly needy time, uh, the country of Haiti and Haitian Christian Mission and a very challenging environment. So do be in prayer for them. Would you bow as we open in prayer this morning? Lord, you are so good to us. And we are thankful for the opportunity to pray on behalf of each of these on our prayer list. We do pray for each of the needs represented, uh, for the lives of the people and for their recovery and for their healing and for your strength and comfort. Father, we lift up the country of Haiti and all the difficulties there. And we do pray for Haitian Christian Mission, that you would bless them and keep them safe. And uh, such a vital ministry in such a difficult part of the world. Father, uh, we pray for the ongoing situations around the world, uh, some very serious situations. Lord, we thank you for Mark. We thank you that he is able to share with us today. Open our hearts and our minds to the truth of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, we wanted to uh, share a video with you regarding our Grief Share program here at Park Plaza Christian Church. My journey through grief was certainly much more difficult than what I ever imagined. There were times I just could not concentrate on things. There's days I wake up and I don't want to do anything. It's just devastating. The grief that happens after the death of a loved one can leave you feeling confused lost and alone without a roadmap. But other people have traveled this grief journey before you, and there is hope and a way forward. Grief Share is a proven video-based support group that connects you with others who are traveling the grief journey you're on right now. Grief Share is a place where you can be as raw and as ugly as you want to be, and it's okay. I joined them online and it was great. It was wonderful. Each weekly Grief Share session consists of an insightful video with grief experts and testimonials, a small group discussion, and encouraging workbook exercises. You'll also receive free online resources and tools that help you move forward in hope and healing. I gained so much more than just understanding of grief and I think I saw it from a bigger picture, too. Visit griefshare.org to learn more. We are grateful for our Grief Share program that is offered here by Park Plaza Christian Church and for Carla and for Larry and for Marge and others who have helped with that in the past, and they will be starting up again this fall uh, with that program. We continue today the study that Mark has been giving us through the Book of Acts and especially now following the travels of the Apostle Paul and his ministry. During the travels, he went to several different cities, even on different continents, different cultures, um, ministered to people who had different social statuses, and all that we will learn about some today. In a portion of the scripture, um, the Apostle Paul makes it a point to discuss God's plan that um, the Jews didn't understand, much of the world still does not understand, God's plan of salvation meant that a Messiah would come, but that Messiah had to suffer. He had to endure the things that are on this earth, and the greatest suffering of all, he had to carry our burden, our sins, with him on the cross. In Matthew, it records where Jesus actually told his uh, disciples this very thing, why he had come. Um, They didn't understand then, not until after his resurrection, but I just wanted to read a portion of that that will kind of go along with our thoughts for this morning. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. I chose a couple songs that kind of talk about the, uh, the purpose of Jesus coming from birth to uh, what he taught us here on earth to death and then to resurrection. So we're going to sing these two songs just to uh, keep our focus on that, beginning with the chorus, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. I love 
to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the From the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save. To show the way from the earth to the cross, my debt to pay, from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day. Sin was as black as could be. Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men. My example is He, living He loved me, dying He saved me, buried He carried my sins for a. Freely forever, one day he's coming. Oh, glorious day! One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on the tree, suffering anguish, despised and rejected. Sins, my Redeemer is He. Living, He loved me. Dying, He saved me. Buried, He carried my sins far away. Rising, He justified freely forever. One day. Seal him no longer. One day the stone rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death he had conquered. Now is a sin. going to sing a song that reminds us that the only way of salvation we have was through the sinless sacrifice of Jesus. Calvary is the only way, and Calvary covers all our sins. We'll be singing this song as we prepare to share in the Lord's Supper. Uh, we'll have a time of meditation and prayer, and then I'll return, and we'll partake of these emblems in the cups um, together after we have our prayer.
Jesus alone for my sin did atone and Calvary covers it all Calvary covers it all my past with its sin and stain my guilt and despair Jesus took on him there and Calvary covers it all the stripes that he bore and the thorns that he wore told his mercy and love evermore and my heart bowed in shame as I called on my crucified Lord my redemption complete I then found at his feet and Calvary covers it all Calvary covers it all my past with the sin and stain my guilt and despair Jesus took on him there and Calvary covers it all good morning everyone I just have a short footnote before I start, I am Bill, but I'm not Bill Blair. <laughs> He's the one in the bulletin. As we come around the Lord's table, I would like to share a few of my thoughts with you. I know everyone has favorite things, whether it's a professional ball player, a favorite sports team, a song, a hymn, a sermon, even a Bible verse. And some people have even told me they have a favorite ministry. <clears throat> some years ago, Gene Waite, with his deep baritone voice, delivered a communion message about our universal donor. It was my favorite. It was very inspirational. Some of it may remember it. So I have noticed while watching television lately that from time to time, the Red Cross announces a shortage of blood supply that it keeps on hand for victims of car accidents, illnesses, and people facing surgeries. Sometimes the Red Cross pleads for volunteers to come <clears throat> forward and donate blood because of the shortage is becoming a life or death situation and there is a certain kind of donor that they are looking for. That's because not all blood is the same. Blood is classified into type A, B, A, B, and O. Each type is either positive or negative, depending on whether it contains an RH factor. Certain blood types are incompatible with each other and would cause severe reaction if they were given to the wrong people. 
That is why the Red Cross is eager to receive donations of type O negative blood because it is compatible with every other blood. People with O negative blood are called universal donors. But spiritually speaking, we are all in a life or death situation. Because of our sin, we each need a universal donor. And that is exactly what Jesus Christ became for us at Calvary's cross. The blood of the Holy Lamb of God is the only type that can wash away sins of all the people for all times. There has never been and there will never be a shortage supply. Calvary covers it all. Christ's blood is powerful today as it ever was. He is our universal donor. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we come around this Lord's table to remember your Son who died on Calvary, where his blood covered our sins. As we take of these emblems, may we do it pleasing in your sight. We pray this prayer in your Son's name. Amen. Are you familiar with the song, How Great Thou Art? If you would like to know a little history about that particular song, you might Google it and ask for Almighty God. It was a, written by a Swedish preacher, missionary, member of the parliament, it's entitled, O Stout Good. There were nine stanzas to the poem, and I would really encourage you to research that because it was quite an inspiration that he wrote nine stanzas to Almighty God. And he reveals his feelings towards the creation, the trees, the birds, the moon, the stars, and all the things that Almighty God has created. I wanted to share that with you so you would not think I had misused this Swedish melody with words of my own. Almighty God. <coughs> Almighty God, when I behold the wonders of all the world so gloriously arrayed, the sun and moon and every star up yonder and all the things thy mighty hand hath made. My soul is filled with singing, Lord, to Thee, Almighty God, how great Thou art. My soul is filled with singing, Lord, to Thee, Almighty God. Behold a forest and know that thou hast planted every tree. In memory's eye, I see a tree on Calvary where thy dear son was crucified for me. 
My soul is filled with singing, Lord, to Thee. Almighty God, how great Thy love. My soul is filled with singing, Lord, to Thee. Almighty God, of time have like a vapor vanished and all the saints are gathered round the throne we'll sing his praise while ages roll unending and worship him who did for sin atone. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee, Almighty God, how great Thy love. My soul is filled with sin, Let's pray. Almighty God, you are great. We thank you for being our God, for being our Savior, for being our King. We're thankful for every opportunity that we have to hear your word proclaimed, and I pray that this morning that you will open our hearts and our minds and open our very souls so that we can, through your Holy Spirit, receive the message that Mark has prepared for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, I got back from a men's conference that I did up in Wisconsin and crawled in bed at 2.30 this morning. I can hardly wait to hear what I'm going to say. Um, <laughs> we'll just see how this rolls and uh, hopefully you'll get something from it. Have you ever uh, been a little intimidated by those people that are socially speaking sort of up the ladder from you? Have you somehow felt like you didn't measure up to those folks, that you were just a little out of place maybe, that you didn't have enough clout to be in the situation or in the context, maybe you felt like you were a little over your head? When we negotiate down the social ladder, we can kind of deal with that a little bit. But negotiating up this ladder is like, wow, I don't know if I have anything as a Christian to offer these people. Maybe you have seen the public uh, broadcast system uh, television program called Keeping Up Appearances with good old Hyacinth who tries to portray herself as a real uppity person in society and really it's just not the case. But anyway, maybe that's our efforts. We've been in this situation before. Uh, we stayed at their request, actually, Mike and Patty's house out in Glenwood Springs, Colorado, on the western slope, beautiful, looks out into the mountains, just marvelous. And then we went into their den, and we noticed that they had pictures with themselves in their den with George W. Bush. And they had pictures of themselves with Condoleezza Rice, and all of a sudden we're thinking, yeah, we don't belong in this den here. That's not the circles in which we swim. Uh, we were at Jim and Connie's house one time. They lived just west of Indianapolis. And uh, Jim invented a water filtration system that they use in all the Olympic pools so that the water is just perfect, you know, for those athletes. And he did very well, of course, financially with that. And his wife would go to exercise classes with the wives of the Indianapolis Colts. And we were in their theater in their home. 
you caught what I said, their theater in their home, thinking to ourselves, don't touch anything. We're just not going to be able to relate to this situation. Our friends Rick and Diane, uh, uh, um, oh, I'll get it, Russo. Wow, why did that slip me? Uh, in Longmont, Colorado, we just, it's hard for us. Rick just works in circles that I don't have any context for. He was flying to Texas to talk to the Texas Rangers about donating millions of dollars for the Jesus Gets Us campaign that you've seen on television with regard to the Olympics. I'm thinking, yeah, I don't swim in those circles. About the epitome for me is going to a Joplin Outlaws game and going to Shakes for Custard afterwards. That's about as good as it gets. So does this make sense? How about for you? Many of us bread and butter people, we just feel a little out of place when we're negotiating up the social ladder. I wonder if Paul and Silas felt the same way in Acts chapter 17. You remember we're in this series, Open Door, Open Conversations, how we're to strike up conversations about Jesus with people. And in chapters 13 and 14 of Acts, the first missionary journey, and then in 15, there's this church council to say, what are we going to do with all these Gentiles coming into church? Then in chapter 16, last week, we talked about the idea of all kinds of people could come, good people, bad people, indifferent people like the jailer in Philippi. Then we come to Acts 17. And clearly, the gospel has to relate to people up the social ladder. When you go to Thessalonica, that was the capital of Macedonia. When you go to Berea, they examine the scriptures daily to see if these things were true. When you go to Athens, oh my goodness, the place of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. Now when you get to chapters 18 and 19, you go down the social ladder to Corinth and Ephesus, at least morally speaking you do. But in chapter 17, these are the elite unbelievers. Not like chapter 14 in Lystra, where you have illiterate unbelievers. These are the elite people. These are, socially speaking, those people that are above us. And if I was therefore putting it in a sentence for you today, it would come out something like this. Jesus' conversations, that is to say, when we have Jesus' conversations with elite unbelievers, we kind of have to deconstruct and then reconstruct their worldview. It's not always easy to do. But when we have the Jesus conversations with people that are pretty much socially above us, we might have to deconstruct what they believe in order to get to reconstruct their worldview as it relates to Jesus Christ. Let me give you a few examples of what I'm talking about from the text itself. If you have your Bibles or your devices, turn with me to Acts chapter 17. And in each of these three cities, Thessalonica and Berea and Athens, you will see the Gospels going up the social ladder. So here to just give you a sample, chapter 17, verse 4. And some of them, the people at Thessalonica, were persuaded by the Apostle Paul and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. Now, I want you all ladies in the crowd to notice that sometimes you are told in biblical studies areas that all the women in the ancient world were oppressed and treated like cattle. And, well, that was true sometimes. But in the Greco-Roman world, some of the women had great prominence. And they're mentioned here. Skip down to Berea in verse 12 of Acts 17 says this many of them therefore believed and not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men so once again the gospel is going uphill in chapter 17 in Athens verse 18 some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with Paul some scholars would say well Athens wasn't on Paul's radar he didn't have much success there I don't buy that because the very last verse of the chapter says, verse 34, but some men joined Paul and believed, good, among whom were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So do you see what I'm saying? How does it go when you're telling the conversation about Jesus to people that socially speaking are somehow a little above you? Sometimes we forget those people because we kind of think to ourselves, they've got so much. They have intelligence, they have money, they have clout, they have prominence. And we forget that they need Jesus. And we get a little intimidated by them. 
Can I take you on the journey for there just a little bit? I want to put up last week's map because we're going to leave Philippi after the earthquake and the jailer's conversion. And we're going to go on the Via Ignatia, the road to Rome out of Philippi. And we're going to go to Amphipolis and Apollonia. They were just little places kind of on the map. It'd be like Galena and Route 66. That's what it would be like. Not big places, but just they're on the way. And then they get to Thessalonica, the capital of Macedonia. 200,000 people back in Paul's day, 200,000 people today. It's a big city. There's prominence there. People, it's on the coast. People go there for vacation, right? Carl and Jill, they go there for vacation. And then you go down to Berea. That's also on the road. And then you go south to Athens. So that's the journey. We'll go that far today. We'll look at Corinth and Ephesus a little later. But let me just take you by pictures to a few of those spots. Let's first of all go to, uh, the text starts out with kind of a, a, a plaque, if you will, that tells about Amphipolis. And at Amphipolis, there was, uh, which is now today out in kind of a field, again, a small town on the Via Ignatia, on the way, there are this, there's this lion let me show you a couple pictures of this lion. That lion was there when Paul walked by it. It's still there. It's out in the middle of a field, and you just think, wow, what is this doing here? But that marked the spot of Amphipolis. And then they went down to Apol- uh, uh, Apol- what's, what, I'll get it right here. Apollonia. And at Apollonia, you see this inscription that the apostle Paul was there. Obviously, it was an inscription that was put there later on. But then we come to Thessalonica. And it's a modern city, so you kind of have to look in the nooks and the crannies. But this is part of the wall that was the original wall in Thessalonica. And somewhere in that area was a Jewish synagogue, and Paul would have spoken in that Jewish synagogue. Here's a second picture. That's Mark Moore doing some teaching there. Second picture of that wall. And then we come out of Thessalonica, and we go to Berea. I don't have much good picture of Berea. We do have a little place of Berea that shows where the Jewish synagogue was. So that's about it. It's on the road. But then we come to Athens. I could bore you till the cows come home with pictures from Athens. And in a few weeks, some of us from the church are going to be there. And this is what you would see, first of all, is the place of the original Olympic Stadium. Now, that's not that they've rebuilt the stadium in that location. It's very small compared to Olympic stadiums today. But that's what you would say. That's the place where it was. And if we keep going on, in some, there's the famous Parthenon. It's up on the Acropolis. That is the temple dedicated to the worship of the Greek goddess Athena. The day we were there, by the way, it just so happened that the MU basketball team from Columbia was there. They had no dif- difficulty, Johnny Longlegs, going up those big steps. But some of us squatty bodies had a little hard time maneuvering those big steps at the Parthenon. But that's up there. You would, Very impressive. Paul would have seen it his day. Another picture of it you can kind of see there. The size of the columns. Some of them have been rebuilt. Some of them were st- stood the test of time. Another picture I would show you is this is Mark. More you can see in the background the Parthenon and he's doing some teaching there with some of us in the crowd teaching about Paul's speech to Athens which brings me to the next slide and that's this one that's the famous marble rock of Athens it's called the Areopagus although one day in church Chuck Swindoll's associate minister pronounced it Areopagus no 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 it's Areopagus. And Areopagus is the Mars Hill. This is where Paul, and what you got the Agora, the marketplace close by. You can look up the hill at the Parthenon, and that's where he gave Acts 17. That's the place. And if you want to see the steps, these are the steps. That guy, by the way, his name is Mark, and he's from Ohio, and that's all I know about him. But anyway, um, he, th- those are the steps. And Paul would have climbed up those steps to be on the top of that rock to give this speech. And the last slide I want to show you is just that that is the speech in Greek that's inscribed there at Mars Hill on the Areopagus. Now, as we'll say later, the Areopagus is not only a place, it's a group of people. So we kind of got to get our arms around that. But I hope you get this idea that if you're going to go to Thessalonica, if you're going to go to Berea, if you're going to go to Athens, and you're going to tell people about Jesus, you might have to kind of deconstruct their worldview to get them to really look at Jesus and a reconstructed Christian worldview. Now, let me illustrate this in kind of a silly way, if I can. It it works like this. Have you ever texted somebody, and either through autocorrect or something, the text wasn't quite right? Yeah? 
I'm guessing from the laughter some of you have been there. So this happened to one of our daughters-in-law, uh, her, her husband, our son, they were building a house, and she texted the builder. She said, I'm looking forward to meeting with you at 3 p.m., except what came out in the text was, I'm looking forward to mating with you at 3 p.m. <laughs> now, you read that text, and by the way, she would be mortified if I was telling this today, because... <laughs> She, she's very, very kept and cultured and proper. And anyway, it just came out. You kind of had to read that and go, I, I don't think that's what she means. And, and you would say, well, we got to deconstruct. Oh, she meant to meet with. So you deconstruct that and you reconstruct with the right idea. It happened to me this very week. Uh, some of you know that we've purchased this house over in Sunnyvale, so we're working on it and scraping popcorn ceiling off of the ceiling, you know, and trying to get it ready. Some people from the church have actually helped us. Grebe Wickland was there this last week, and I didn't have a big enough ladder. I just had brought over from the house the six-foot ladder, not the eight-foot ladder, to be able to get to the, you know, ceiling in the hearth room that goes up. And Ken's been back there to help us and different ones of you. But anyway, so I needed to get a bigger ladder. So I said to Grebe, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go, I don't know if I get my eight footer in Carlos Buick, but I'm going to try. So I will go home and th sure enough, we were able to get the eight foot ladder in the Buick in vision. And so got it in it. So I texted, I texted Grebe and I said, Hey, I'll take it there in the morning. I got the eight foot ladder in my Buick. I will have it at the house for you in the morning. Except it didn't come out eight foot ladder. It came out. I put the eight foot lady <laughs> in the Buick and I'll have her, her there <laughs> in the morning. So not even knowing I had done that, he texts back, I'm looking forward to meeting your eight-foot lady. <laughs> so you think, okay, I don't think he meant lady. I think, so you deconstruct that, say that's not what he meant. What he really, that's kind of what we have to do when we have Jesus conversations with people. You might have to take away their their view, their worldview, and exalt something else. And that's what we'll see here. I wonder what we'd find in Thessalonica, just, just, to, just to accelerate the pace of this a little bit. Let's look at these first nine verses. We won't have time to read them all. But a few verses from chapter 17 about Thessalonica. What we'll see is the suffering Savior and the resurrected Lord. The suffering Savior and the resurrected Lord. Something will have to be has to be kind of deconstructed so that we can construct the right thing. Look at this in verses 1 to 3, if you have your Bibles there. It says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Deja vu, we've seen this a lot of times. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days... Now some scholars say, see, he was only there three weeks. But it doesn't say that. It just says on three Sabbath days. He reasoned with them from the Scriptures. And by the way, we learned from the other epistles that he received gifts from Philippi more than once. So I, I don't think he was at Thessalonica long, but I was thinking he was longer than three weeks is my guess. So anyway, it says he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. Did you notice the three cognitive words? It says reasoned which is a word that means to speak up and through and around and about, and explain, which means to open up, and prove, which means to place before. All three words deal with the brain. Paul is dealing with apologetic evangelism. He's trying to make a case for the fact that the Messiah had to suffer, and that's the stumbling block. That's the difficulty. That's what needs deconstructed. Because you see, the people in that synagogue, far as they were from Jerusalem, did not accept the fact that the Messiah would have to suffer. This is upside down. The Messiah shouldn't suffer. The Messiah should reign with almighty power. He doesn't have to suffer. And so Paul has to explain, no, he had to suffer, and this proves that he was really the Messiah. Now, for us, that's not maybe necessarily a big hurdle, but for those people it was. And Mark Moore in his commentary reminds us partly why. There's only really, if you press it, only really two Old Testament passages that talk specifically about the suffering of the Messiah. Only two. Isaiah 52, verse 13, to Isaiah 53, verse 12. That section called the suffering servant section is one of the big ones. The other one is Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, which says they will look on him whom they have pierced. 
That's about it. And so if you say, maybe we shouldn't be upset with our Jewish forefathers in missing this suffering Messiah because it wasn't as big prevalent. But Mark Moore goes on to say, and he's right about this, of course, is that in the broader, what the scholars call the meta-narrative, the big story, you see suffering all over the place. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, the patriarchs, suffered as wandering nomads. Israel suffered in Egyptian bondage. Israel suffered in Babylonian captivity. And then came the Persians. And then came the Greeks. And by the time of Jesus, then came the Romans. The point is, the Messiah has been surrounded by suffering all the way through. Because he is the new Israel. He is the kingdom of God. He is the temple of God. So even though it might have been a difficult thing, Paul is just saying, no, no, i got to deconstruct this. Your view of the Messiah is wrong-headed. He had to suffer. Because if he didn't suffer... We wouldn't have any salvation. We've talked about that already in our service today. And I would just say to you this, that that still remains one of the number one apologetic issues for us. If God is good, then how's come all this suffering? And people want to have that conversation without talking about Jesus. Good luck. You can't have a conversation about why God is good and why is there all this suffering if you don't talk about Jesus. Because Jesus is engulfed in suffering. It's Jesus. In Jesus Christ, God himself suffered. And that has all kinds of explaining power to why we suffer as we do. So he has to kind of deconstruct so that he can give them a resurrected Lord. Well, of course, what goes on, if we read the rest of this section of the first nine verses, is that basically some people from the marketplace, the Greek word is the agora, they get a rabble-rousers group together, and they run Paul out of town. In fact, before they even get that far, Paul is seemingly absent, and so they pick up Jason, who seems to be related to Paul, if you look at Romans 16, 21. They pick up Jason, and they make him pay bail, And ultimately, persecution results, and Paul and Silas leave the uppities of Thessalonica, the people above them. But he had to do some deconstruction before he could do some, you know, reconstruction, if you will, of their worldview. But this is the famous passage that has in it verse 6. Do you remember verse 6? That those men who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Oh, may it be said of you, and may it be said of me, that we turn the world upside down by helping people say, no, you have to understand, he had to suffer. He had to suffer so that he could be resurrected and identify with all of us in flesh and blood. Well, the next town is Berea, and we get to Berea in verses 10 to 15, and I would label it this way, examine claims and satisfied minds. Examine claims and satisfied minds. Now, there's probably not as much deconstruction and reconstruction in Berea, to be real honest with you. But when they get there, we read verses 10 and 11. I'd like you to go there in your Bibles with me. Verse 10 says, The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night, get out of Dodge quick, but to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. That's what they always do. Now, these Jews were more noble. Actually, the word means Good raced, R-A-C-E-D. They were good raced. They were of good race. And this is not a racial slur or racial issue at this point. It's just saying these people were noble. They were, they, they were good. Then those in Thessalonica, because they received the word with eagerness, hope you do, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were true. The word examining is on a credo. They, it's the idea of thinking up. They, they thought up about this. They had to examine it. They had to play with it. They had to think about it. And so there is this examining of the claims and having a satisfied mind. I wish that I had a dollar for every time I've been to a church that had one of the Bible school classes named the Berean class. You've been to those churches? <laughs> the Berean class. I've been to a lot of churches that had a Berean class. And they name it after this church because they examine the scriptures daily to see if these things were true. I wish I had a dollar for every town I've been in that had a Berean bookstore. I remember going to hospital in Springfield, Illinois, to Memorial St. John's Hospital to visit. And I always, on the way home, stopped at the Berean bookstore because I was sure there was just one more book I needed to get. Anyway, the idea is Bereans. What makes them so noble? What makes them noble, what makes them higher up is because they examined these things to see if they were true. Listen, don't take my word for it. 
Don't take a missionary's word for it. Don't take your Sunday school's word for it. Don't take an elder's word for it. Don't take a radio or TV evangelist's word for it. No. Examine it yourself. And then like Josh McDowell, you might not have all the answers, but you will have a satisfied mind. You will have a satisfied mind. Now, this, this does relate to a lot of things. Let me relate it this way. Um, have you ever had a certain way of thinking about Scripture, maybe for several years, only to finally come to the conclusion you were wrong? Been there. I'll just mention one of them for me. I don't know how many years I preached and taught that Jesus nailed the Old Testament law to the cross. And I was convicted when the philosopher and doctrine professor from Abilene Christian University named Randy Harris showed me that that's not what Colossians 2 talks about. As he dealt with that Greek word stoikia, the fundamentals, the elementary things of the world. No, I, yes, the covenant changed when Jesus died. I'm not denying that. We move from Mosaic to Christian. I get that part. But would Paul have ever said that the law was nailed dead? When he says in Romans, the law is good. The law is holy. The law is perfect. And I got to thinking, no, Paul, I don't think would have said that. No, what got canceled was the written code which underlined our sin. It was our sin that got attached to the cross, not the law. And I just flat had it wrong. So that's why we have to keep examining the scriptures and evaluating our positions because we just might be wrong. Well, we'll go on to Athens just in the interest of time and I call it creator God and coming judge. Creator God and coming judge, verses 16 to 34. Now I got to be honest with you, by the time Paul and Silas got to Athens, the city was actually in decline. Today, Athens is a huge city. We're talking to millions of people. But by the time Paul got there, it was living on past laurels of the great philosophers of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. It was the size of Carthage, Missouri. It really was. It had all these temples. In fact, a fellow by the name of Alexander said it was easier to find a god in Athens than it was a man. And a guy by the name of Xenophon said that the whole city was kind of like one big altar to gods. And here's what it happens. While Paul is waiting for Timothy and Silas to get there, the Bible says he's kind of trying to wait it out. Some scholars would say it wasn't even on his radar at first. But it says his spirit was provoked. It means irritated. Ever happened to you? Ever had those moments where you think, now wait a minute. Somebody is not advocating for God the right way. When I watch the news, I get a little lathered up. And I think, now wait a second, that is not a Christian worldview. You are not espousing what Scripture says. So when was the last time you got hacked off because somebody didn't have a right view about God? Well, Paul is upset. And that's why he reasoned in three places. The synagogue, the religious place, the agora, the marketplace, and on Mars Hill, the Areopagus, where the philosophers gathered. He would take any place he could possibly get. And after they heard him talking about resurrection for a while, they said, you know, this guy's just a babbler. Because they spent their time in doing nothing but talking about the latest. And the word babbler actually means seed picker. <laughs> like a bird that would just be picking away at seeds. That's what they called Paul as he tries to deconstruct and reconstruct. And basically when he's at the Areopagus, it would be us like us saying Wall Street. Wall Street's a real street in southern Manhattan in New York City. But Wall Street's also about a bunch of brokers who ring a bell. It's people and a place. And that's exactly what this is. It's a rock, it's Mars Hill, but it's also a philosophy, it's a view. It'd be like Hyde Park in London. No wonder they called him a babbler. And I guess I would say this, what Paul is going to in part do, I, I, I used to say in his speech, he undercuts everything that the Stoic and Epicurean philosophers believed. I've since believed in qualifying that a little bit and say, he doesn't disagree with everything they believed. A few things they believed, they actually had probably right, just by observing the world. 
But to a great extent, when he gives this wonderful speech in Acts 17, he sort of undercuts, again, that's this this deconstruction and tries to get it the other way. Let, Let me show you what I mean. And that's in verses 22 to 23, if you have your Bible still open. Verse 22, so Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you're very religious. Sounds like a really kind way to start, doesn't it? At first pass. But that phrase, very religious, actually is a triad kind of Greek word. Not a compound Greek word, it's a triad. (laughs) And it has the word fear, and the word demon, and the word firm in it. All three. It's not exactly a compliment. Sort of, but not really. It'd be like going to New York and say, y'all just a bunch of hicks. It'd be like going to Texas and saying, y'all just a bunch of sissies. No, you wouldn't do that. Well, this is what Paul, I see you're very, um, very um, religious. And they kind of said, oh, th- 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 thank you. Thank you. They're not sure how to thank him for this. And he goes on to say, for as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. There's a whole story behind that. I don't know what to do with it. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. Paul took the occasion. There was this guy by the name of Diogenes Laertes. And he tells the story, you can do with it as you will, that there was a plague sweeping southern Macedonia, a plague sweeping over the area of Athens. And the only way to get rid of the plague was to appease the gods. The gods are obviously mad at us. So they set off to Crete. Because on the island of Crete was a guy named Epimenides. Who, by the way, Paul has read and will quote before the sermon's over. So they bring Epimenides from the island of Crete to Athens. And he says, I can fix this. Here's what you do. Get you a bunch of sheep, black, white, doesn't matter. Get you some sheep, put them on the Acropolis, shoo them away, let them run down the hill. And when they stop, wherever they stop or lay down, kill them. And on that spot, offer that sacrifice of that lamb to an unknown God. Because you've obviously offended the gods. That's why the plagues are here. And therefore, if you, you don't know their name, so we'll just call it unknown. Is that the background to this? Some of you might be saying, can we believe this? I I don't know that it matters that we believe it necessarily. All I'm going to say to you is this, that Paul will take what they did believe by calling them very religious and by referring to this unknown God, he will start where they are. That's what we always have to do. And he will do a little deconstruction so that he can construct the right worldview. And I probably should have put this on the screen, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to give you the outline to this sermon. So the outline to Paul's sermon goes something like this. Point one, God created the world. That struck at the heart of what some of the Stoic and Epicurean philosophers believed. Number two, God sustains life. Number three, God rules nations. Number four, God is father of us all. Number five, God will judge the world. Number six, God wants to be sought by you. We are his offspring, which is exactly what we read in verse 29. Be after he's quoted Eratus and Epimenides. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by art or imagination of man. The times of ignorance, and that's not being used pejoratively, that just means you don't know. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Oh, I guess history's not cyclical. I guess it's going somewhere. So you need to change your direction, change your mind, change your affections, change your desires, change your behavior. You need to repent, he says, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he's given assurance to all by raising that man from the dead. We just never get away from this resurrection in the latter part of the book of Acts, do we? It's just always there. And so what is Paul doing? He's undercutting, he's destroying, he's deconstructing, but then he's building back something of significance here. Paul asserted that history was going somewhere. 
Many of you, when David Faust was here, bought his book, Not Too Old. And if you got through that book, you uh, knew the story he told in the book about Ernest Becker. In 1973, Ernest Becker wrote a book called The Denial of Death. The deni- he says, we Americans, are cra- we will do anything to deny death. We will all kinds of take care of our bodies. We'll do this and that. We, we want to kind of live in a deny. In 1973, it came out. In 1974, it won a Pulitzer Prize. Two months after he won the Pulitzer Prize, he died at the age of 49. He got cancer. Which just underlines, you can write a book like that and say Americans are good at denying this issue called death out there. But the Bible says in Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed unto men once to die. And then comes the judgment. Paul has to deconstruct. Sometimes when you talk to your neighbors and they're elite unbelievers, they're up the social ladder from you, you might have to destroy a little bit of their thinking before they might be open to the gospel. Um, Wayne Shaw used to tell us in preaching class, when you don't know how to conclude a sermon, when all else fails, go back to the text. And that's good advice for today because Paul got three reactions to his sermon that day. Did you catch those if you read the whole thing? He got three reactions to his sermon. One reaction was some of them mocked, oh, fooey, resurrection of the dead. You must be a seed picker. You must be a babbler. Some mocked. Some people are mocking today, are they not? Some people said, we'll hear you about this another day. We'll come next week, see what you got to say. And some of them believed. And my hunch is in our second service today, (laughs) there could be, could be all three of those reactions. Some would say, another sermon, another day, okay, whatever. Just kind of mock our way out of church. Some would say, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to walk the aisle, add myself to the fellowship of church, repent of my sins, be baptized into Christ. I'm ready to do it. And you just wish the preacher would shut up and we could get there. Now, some of you, though that really scare me might say we'll hear you about it some other day well let me ask you this what if you don't have another day I don't mean to be unkind but do you know you have another day we'll hear you about this another day all three of those responses are there I'll close with this there was a church father by the name of Tertullian something very similar in the secular realm is said by a fellow named Petronius And they said this question. They asked this question. It's a very good question, actually, in many ways. Though Tertullian was very anti-human philosophy, he said this. What hath Athens to do with Jerusalem? For him, there was a big divide. Jerusalem is the Bible, the gospel, Jesus. Athens is human philosophy. It's nothing. It's worthless. They never the twain shall meet. Okay. I get it. Sometimes there's a big disconnect between what we believe and what the world believes, right? Sure, sure. But I would argue that if Athens would listen to Jerusalem, maybe salvation could come. We might want to ask today, what hath Joplin to do with Jerusalem? What's the interface between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world? If you are one of those people wrestling with those two kingdoms, I hope we could just let you see the futility of the one you might be putting your confidence in to rise up and say, this is the, this is the constructed one by God. This is restructured for you called the kingdom of God. Maybe there's a decision publicly that should be made today. If so, I want to encourage you to make it. I'll be right here to greet you. Let's stand together. Let's sing right now. to wire
center wire. 